Thank you, Sergey, and uh, thank you very much for your kind words and for uh, the invitation to speak. So you you asked me specifically to concentrate on on the basic principles. So although I have a rather long title, which contains all this stuff about quantum inform information and decoherence, I will just put that at the end because I believe what what was wanted was the basic principles. So I I will concentrate on that. So the um, I first of all should just give thanks to various people who've contributed to this work. Um, in fact, it should be a much longer list than this, although Tom Lancaster and Francis Pratt um, have been very long-standing colleagues and have contributed to a lot of this work. Um, but I wanted to particularly thank Johnny Wilkinson, who on the decoherence work was the uh, key person, a student at Oxford who's now working at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory at the ISIS facility. Um, this is a picture of Oxford, so this is one of the old buildings, but this is not where we do the muon spin rotation experiments, so although it looks a bit like an accelerator, it's not. So um, this is the structure of my talk. Um, I will first of all say uh, what a muon is and give that part of the basic introduction, and then I will say something about muon decay and why that helps the technique to work. And then I will finish with some examples, but actually most of the talk is in these some examples. So I will go through the first three parts relatively quickly. I will then give a number of examples that I hope will touch some science areas that are of interest to you. And I will finish up with the decoherence part. OK, so let's just begin right at the basics what, what a muon is. So if you look at various different particles, this is a table of properties and shows you many of the most important features of properties like the muon, the pion from which it is uh, produced, and the electron and the proton. So this shows you, of course, the mass in lots of different units. Uh, it shows you the charge state. Now, of course, uh, I've written here the mu plus, so it has a charge of plus E, but I could have written mu minus. There is a negative muon as well. Uh, but we don't normally uh, do experiments with it. Sometimes we do, but everything I will say in this talk is about the positive muon because it turns out to be the most important one. Similarly, electrons come in either charged state, but of course in condensed matter physics, we're usually dealing with negative electrons and positively charged uh, protons. Something that the muon and the electron and the proton all have in common is that they are spin one half particles. And this means they have a magnetic moment. And the magnetic moment is, of course, inversely proportional to the mass. So the most massive particle here on this list, which is the proton, um, has the smallest magnetic moment. Similarly, the electron, which is the, um, which is the lightest particle, has the largest magnetic moment. So if we measure this in nuclear magnetons, the proton's about 2.8. Uh, the electron is about 1800. And that's just scaling roughly with the mass. And there's also a G factor in there. The muon is somewhere in between. It's like a, uh, a few times higher than, than that of the proton. Now, one of the things that this magnetic moment feeds into is this very important constant called the gyromagnetic ratio. And the gyromagnetic ratio tells you this ratio between the angular momentum and the magnetic moment. And in particular, it tells you how fast you process in a particular magnetic field. Now, these numbers for the proton, 42.5 uh, megahertz per tesla, is, of course, very important in proton NMR. If you apply one tesla, the protons all will process at 42.577 megahertz, plus or minus a bit, depending on chemical shifts, but something of that order. For the electrons, it's much higher. So it's in the gigahertz per tesla, 28 gigahertz per tesla. The muon, again, is closer to the proton, 135 uh, megahertz per tesla. The crucial thing about that number, though, is that it is a known constant. So this is something we can rely on. And the final line in the table shows you, of course, another big difference between these particles, which is that electrons and protons essentially live forever, as far as we can tell, or at least they live longer than the lifetime of the universe by many orders of magnitude, but the muon only lives for two microseconds. So this is a relatively short-lived particle, although not as short-lived as the, as the pion. Okay, so this is now just summarizing those things um, in, a, in a more colorful fashion. The muon, in some sense, is fitting in between the electron and the proton. And again, although the proton and the electron live forever, the muon only lives for 2.2 microseconds. So this is a big difference between these particles. 
Um, something though that is different between the muon and the proton and the electron is that in both NMR and ESR, electron spin resonance, what you do is you have, for example, for proton NMR spin a half particle, you apply a magnetic field and you Zeeman split two energy levels, and then they are differently populated by the Boltzmann factor. This gives you a tiny polarization. So in a typical NMR experiment, 50.001% or something like that of your spins are up and 49.999% are down. You have an absolutely tiny polarization um, unless your magnetic fields are enormous and your temperature is incredibly low. But most of the time you have a tiny polarization. And therefore, the only way in which you can do a detection is to do it resonantly. It's nuclear magnetic resonance. You apply a radio frequency photon whose energy matches that of the Zeeman split states. As I'll show you in MUSR, we have no worries like this. We don't have to do it resonantly because our muon beams have 100% have spin polarization. So we are not dealing with a small signal. We're dealing with an enormous signal. And that's our big advantage. And the other thing, if you compare the muon technique with um, the neutron technique, one great advantage we have is that you can put muons in anything. They do not worry. You don't have to worry, as you do with neutron scattering, that you have to make sure your samples are deuterated if they have hydrogen in. You don't have to worry about tricky elements like iridium or cadmium that become very easily activated by the neutron beam, the muon beam will not activate them. So you can study any compound you like. There's no restriction. Okay, so let me just quickly go through how we do the experiment. So the first thing we do is we have to produce our muons in the first place. And so the way this is done is by firing protons into a, into a target containing light elements. And by the first reaction here, we produce pions. And the pion decay is very rapid. It's about 26 nanoseconds. And uh, when the pion decays, it's a two-body decay. The pion decays into a muon and a neutrino. So I'm dealing here with the pi plus, which decays into a mu plus. And because it's a two-body decay, it's very simple to do the relativistic calculation. This is a sort of first-year exercise. And uh, when the pion uh, decays, it produces the muon and the neutrino. Neutrinos have this very intriguing feature that their spin is anti-parallel to their momentum. Because the pion has zero spin, if we're dealing with a stationary pion, the muon has to do the same thing. So its spin has to be anti-parallel to its momentum as well because of this feature of the neutrino. And this is the reason why we have 100% spin polarization. It is this quirk of uh, particle physics that means uh, that we have um, uh, we have these polarized beams. And so this is very helpful to us. Okay, now you can do these, these calculations on uh, pions that are initially at rest. These are the pions that decay at the surface of the proton target. They're called surface muons. And if you do the calculation, it's relatively easy to do. What you find is that the energy of the muon produced in that reaction uh, will be uh, the rest mass energy plus kinetic energy of about 4 million electron volts. So this is capital M, 4 million volts. So this is the energy of the muon beam. It has a well-defined momentum and it also has a well-defined speed. So the muons are going at about one quarter of the speed of light. And as I've said already, these muons are 100% spin polarized. Now you can do um, experiments on what are known as decay muons. These are um, muons that come from the pions that decay in flight. Um, Sergei mentioned Rustam Kasanov uh, earlier on at PSI, and Rustam works a lot with decay muons because he wants to get his muons inside a pressure cell because he does a lot of high pressure measurements. And for that experimental technique that he's developed at PSI, he uses decay muons because he, need, he needs more energetic muons with more kinetic energy. But everything I will tell you today is just at these slower ones, which are going at four million volts, a uh, quarter of the speed of light. Okay, so what happens when the muons then go into the sample? So we, we start with this beam of particles with four million volts uh, and quarter of the speed of light. 
So they will enter your sample and they will go through a series of energy loss processes. They will dump some energy um, and they will do various things like ionize atoms. They will form muonium, which is a mu muon and an electron. So they will capture an electron and they'll get rid of it and they'll capture and they'll get rid of it. This all happens on a very, very short time scale until the energy of the muons is down to a, a few hundred electron volts. And then eventually they will stop and they will stop somewhere in your in your crystal. So in one of Sergei's pyroxenes, they will stop at near some oxygen anion. And at this point, they will have very little energy. Now, this is quite a complicated process, but crucially, it only involves Coulombic degrees of freedom. In other words, you are just interacting using the electrostatic Coulomb interaction, shedding charge, picking up charge, but you're not interacting magnetically. So when these muons stop, at some site inside the sample, they are still 100% spin polarized. And that's a very useful feature. Okay, so now we have our muons stationary and located somewhere inside the unit cell, what will happen next? Well, the next thing that will happen is that they will decay. Um, so if you measure the number of counts after implantation, you will just see radioactive decay according to the muon lifetime. And every single muon experiment would look like this. You would just see this exponential decay. So this is not very exciting um, because every sample will do this. So we need to think about uh, how we can get some information out of these curves. And this comes from a feature of muon decay. So when the muon finally decays, it, as I said, it goes at this much more leisurely time, 2.2 microseconds. Unfortunately, it's slightly more complicated. It's a three body decay. So the muon decays into a positron. If it's a positive muon, it goes into an anti-electron, the positron, and a couple of neutrinos. And this is a three body decay. And the problem with this is it means that there's a number of ways in which the energy can be parceled up between these final, final particles. So for example, um, uh, this is uh, the positron roughly stationary with the neutrinos being sent off at high speed. Or another possibility is that the positron could shoot off in one direction and the neutrinos could shoot off in the other direction. And that would give you a range of energies going roughly from zero up to um, half the uh, rest mass energy of the, of the muon. Um, so there's a complication there of the range of energies, but it turns out there's something even more important about muon decay that was discovered back in the late 1950s uh, by Garwin, Lederman and Weinrich. Uh, they were doing this experiment because they had heard about parity violation uh, in, the, in the beta decay experiments of Madame Wu. And they heard about this on a Friday lunchtime and assembled this experiment over the weekend. And by the Monday morning, they had the data. And so their paper was published back to back with the famous paper of Madame Wu. And both papers showed parity violation. For Madame Wu, it was in beta decay. And for these people, it was in, in the muon decay. Uh, now, this is their paper that appeared in 1957. If you read Lederman's uh, book on the same subject, uh, he, when he was reminiscing about it, this, he described this experiment as how we violated parity in a weekend and discovered God. Well, Lederman was a colourful character. Um, anyway, uh, what did they discover? Well, the basic point, and uh, forgive me if this is a very well-known point, uh, but of course, in most physical processes, if you view them in the mirror, this is the kinetic theory of gases, and you view it in the mirror, well, both processes are processes that could happen in our universe. But if you do the same thing with muon decay, so here is the muon with its spin um, pointing upwards, um, it turns out that the positron into which it's, it decays is most likely to be sent out in the same direction as the spin and not in the reverse direction. And what this means is if you view this process in the mirror, now the muon is spinning in the opposite direction, uh, but the mirror image of this positron is this positron here, now in the mirror universe, the positron is anti-parallel to the spin. And the picture on the right does not happen in our universe, only the picture on the left. And this is the violation of parity that they had discovered in, in the 1950s. So a uh, parity violation is, in, is crucially involved in muon decay. Uh, Wolfgang Pauli did not believe this when this result came out. I cannot believe God is a weak left-hander, he said. 
uh, but he was wrong and this is correct. And when we held the International Conference of Muon Spin Rotation in Oxford, I illustrated this um, for the conference logo because I was a conference organizer uh, by drawing a picture of Alice. Some of you may know the books about Alice in the one, Alice in Wonderland or Alice, in, Alice Through the Looking Glass. Um, I did that because those books were written in Oxford by an Oxford um, professor in the in the uh, 19th century. And he was very much interested in logical problems about what happens when you look in look into a mirror. So Alice wanders into the looking glass and enters a new world. But if she'd known about mu SR, she would have also realized that that muon um, uh, does something very odd in the looking glass world. OK, so let me just sort of explain why this is important. So we have this muon decay, decaying into a positron and a couple of neutrinos. Um, the crucial point is that this decay is asymmetric. So what I'm showing here is the muon spin pointing to the right. And what I'm showing in this cardioid, in this pattern, is the probability in which the positron is likely to be emitted. And this takes this particular form. It's quite a complicated form, but the crucial thing to notice is that the positron is most likely to be sent out in the direction of the muon spin, and it's very unlikely to be sent out in the reverse direction. Uh, in fact, if you do this accurately, it does depend on the energy of the positron. So the curves become slightly more complicated. And in fact, for very low energies, uh, the asymmetry is reversed. But on average, we actually have this blue curve. And this blue curve gives us an average asymmetry of about a third, uh, meaning that it's much more likely that the positron is emitted in the same direction as the muon spin. So um, with Forgetting about all of the those fine details, let's just go through how an experiment works. Oh, I should just first of all say that in the paper in 1957, what they uh, noticed was that um, they said it seems possible that polarized positive muons will become a powerful tool for exploring magnetic fields in atoms and interatomic regions. And so in 1957, they predicted that this technique could be important for exploring magnetic fields. And I'll, I'll explain how that works now. So how mu SR works. So um, I showed you before that when we measure the detection of muon decay as a function of time, it just follows an exponential decay. That's not very interesting. But this asymmetry of positron emission is what gives us the useful way of doing things. So here comes the muon into our sample. It, um, it comes in uh, with its spin anti-parallel to its momentum. So you can see as it comes in, the spin is pointing in the opposite direction to its velocity. It's now stopped in a sample. OK, if, we're un if it's unlucky enough to die now at t equals zero, then we will see more counts in this so-called forward detector than we will in the backward detector, because you can see the probability distribution is strongly weighted towards the forward detector and not the backward detector. So we see more counts in the red than in the blue. Uh, the green will show us the average. But I've applied a magnetic field to this sample. And what this means is that if we let time evolve, the muon will lar more precess. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means if we count the counts in the detectors, then of course, on average, we will have this green curve. It will just be exponential decay. But if we look at the individual detectors, the red one and the blue one, what you see is that they oscillate around the exponential decay. Uh, so the blue one is counting a little bit more at this time, which is when these spins were pointing towards the backward detector. So what we do now is we subtract those two curves and divide by the sum, and that gives us the thing that I will plot in all the subsequent graphs. So this essentially is the mechanism through which we can measure how the muon is processing inside our sample. So no resonance, no radio frequency fields, no microwave fields. This is just watching it process in the sample. Now, of course, I've done this by applying a magnetic field, and so this is the world's most expensive magnetometer. Uh, this is not a sensible way of measuring magnetic fields of just applying a magnetic field. But of course, what we can do is we can not apply a magnetic field and have the magnetic field that causes the muons to process to be the internal field inside the, inside the material. And that's what we will do uh, next. Um, I will just briefly show you the same um, 
the same experiment, but this is now a computer animation of the same thing. So in this animation, um, I've drawn the muon coming in, stopping in a sample. And once it's inside the sample, it experiences a magnetic field. It starts processing. And whenever the spin is pointing towards a detector, the detector is triggering. Um, now, these experiments are actually done at, um, as we were discussing earlier, at the uh, at various facilities around the world. The two that I use because they're closest to me are the ISIS muon facility. So this is uh, the diamond light source you can see here. The ISIS neutron and muon source, the protons are accelerated here and they, um, the protons go into this hall and this hall. And it's this one contains the muon beam lines. Uh, Oxford, where I work, is just over here on the left. Um, and we also do experiments at the Paul Scherer Institute in Switzerland, where you can see the Swiss light source and also the muon facilities in this building. And uh, this is just a picture from the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, but shows you what the experiment actually looks like. You can see a cryostat uh, with a sample, uh, which is going into these. Um, there's, there's a magnet here for applying magnetic fields, but you can see these detectors on either side of the sample. Here's a picture of one set of detectors using photomultipliers. Though so we're now going through and replacing these we're using um, avalanche photodiodes, but um, this is another picture of a dilution refrigerator with the muons um, uh, coming in from the left and the, uh, uh, the sample will be inside this dilution refrigerator. Okay, so I've now gone through explaining uh, some of the basics. So what I propose to do for the rest of this lecture is I'll go through some examples and so you can see how, how the technique works and I will also try and explain uh, why it's particularly useful. So one of the first experiments using MUSR that I was involved with uh, a number of years ago now was um, on purely organic magnets. So the interest here is that many magnetic materials require transition metal ions or rare earth to produce the magnetic spin. Uh, Heisenberg had originally said that you could not have ferromagnetism without D block and F block ions in it. But in the early 1990s, some Japanese chemists and various others developed um, new materials which show ferromagnetism, even though they only contain uh, radicals. And these materials um, unfortunately have very low transition temperatures. So this one here um, has a transition temperature of 670 millikelvin. Let's just focus on this one. Uh, which is this made up of these molecules here that have a free radical on that produces a magnetic spin. As you cool down the sample, you can see at 700 millikelvin, the muon data just shows spin relaxation. So the muon spin was 100% polarized, but it then just relaxes in the material due to spin fluctuations. But when you get down to lower temperatures, you can see these oscillations developing and they get faster and faster as you cool. So if you plot this uh, frequency as a function of temperature, you get this curve here. It's zero above 670 millikelvin, and then it grows. And you plot the frequency on this axis, but in fact, we can convert frequency into field because I told you earlier that the gyromagnetic ratio, 135.5 megahertz per tesla is a fundamental constant. So if you've measured a frequency, you've measured a field. So what we know is that the magnetic field at the muon site goes from zero uh, up to something of the order of 15 millitesla in this material. And what's more, you can see these are beautiful oscillations and their amplitude. There's no scale on here, but the amplitude tells us that the 100 percent of the sample is magnetic. So this is a very good way of showing that these materials are fully magnetic. And of course, once we'd done that, we could then move to a number of other similar types of materials. We could measure their order parameters using MUSR. I won't go through all the details. We can measure um, critical exponents uh, using this technique. Again, the nice thing is we're not applying a magnetic field. So we're essentially measuring uh, something like the magnetization, but we're not applying a magnetic field. And of course, if you do squid magnetometry or something like that, you always have to apply a magnetic field to get a signal. Here we're doing it in, in completely zero field. We're even getting rid of the Earth's magnetic field. 
so this has now been, I, I'm just skipping through these examples, but just to show you that we've done this on a large range of uh, different materials. Uh, this was um, an experiment identifying one of the most well-defined one-dimensional ferromagnets that exist. Now, of course, you can do this in not only organic systems, but you can do this in, in oxides, works very well in various magnetic oxides. Here you can see in lanthanum nicolate, uh, you can see beautiful oscillations developing uh, at low temperature. Um, in fact, in, in this sample, you see the oscillations at, at all temperatures. Um, uh, here, when you're doping this nicolate, you see more damped oscillations. But this was used very early on in the study of these nicolates to measure the magnetic transition temperature as a function of doping. And you can see it has some rather interesting features. Um, you get a maximum at the one third um, doping level, which is connected with stripes. So the order parameter is very nice to, to pull out using, um, using MUSR. And we also did this for um, manganites. These are the um, lanthanum strontium Ruddleston popper phase manganites. And again, you can see as you dope these materials, the low temperature MUSR data looks very different between these different phases. And it's because the spins are all pointing in different directions in different ordered uh, arrangements. Uh, one of the most complicated um, systems we looked at, and I think this might be a material Sergei has worked on, uh, is silver nicolate, which is a charge ordered antiferromagnet. And uh, this um, had a very, very complicated MUSR signal. So at high temperature or 20 Kelvin, you just see spin relaxation. At 1.6 Kelvin, uh, you see something that initially looked like noise, but when we took very high uh, statistic data, actually this is signal. And you can see there's a, a large number of oscillations in this, um, in this trace. When you Fourier transform them, you find there's six distinct frequencies. Now, this is rather complicated, and it's because you have a charge ordered antiferromagnet. So the nickels, uh, there are three independent uh, nickel sites. They farm, form a rather complicated charge ordered arrangement. Um, and although the muon is sitting uh, essentially in one muon site, um, working out the uh, what, what's yeah, it produces these these six frequencies. Interestingly, the six frequencies all have a slightly different temperature dependence. So if you plot the temperature dependence of these frequencies, on average, they all go down, but they do some slightly odd things where they uh, they actually work out in pairs. So one of them will go slightly up and the other one will go slightly down, such that their average value for it follows the order parameter. And we think this is because there's some small spin reorientation where the spins are actually moving around as a function of temperature. One very interesting example we discovered um, was based on looking at low dimensions. And I just want to come on to low dimensional magnets because I think they're very interesting. So if you take something like strontium copper oxide, this contains chains of copper oxygens and you get strong super exchange through the oxygen anions, which mean that these chains are very well coupled. But the coupling between the chains is very weak. So you have a J along the chains, which is about 1300 Kelvin. Um, but the nail temperature is only five Kelvin. Of course, a one dimensional magnet should never order. And these are almost one dimensional, but they're really quasi one dimensional. So what happens is that when you get down to very low temperature, the spins have started to order, but they haven't completely ordered. Um, uh, or rather, the fluctuations slow down, but only at very, very low temperature do you get long range magnetic order. So this was done by uh, the Columbia Group. Uh, so this wasn't our work when they studied uh, the MUSR. We looked at an isostructural material about 20 years ago, lanthanum strontium cobalt oxide is what we initially thought it was. Uh, here, the spins are slightly bigger, but the chains are further apart. So we thought this was likely to be a very good one dimensional material. Um, and I took it to PSI and measured it carefully at five Kelvin. Uh, remember the previous material only ordered at five Kelvin. Uh, so I measured it at five Kelvin, it was ordered. Uh, I went up and I went up and I went up and at 300 Kelvin, the thing was still ordered. And this was very surprising. Why should this low dimensional material be so well ordered? Well, we discovered later that in fact, we've got the formula wrong. It turned out with this um, particular material, which was actually made with cobalt in a very unusual oxidation state, cobalt one. It was made with a low temperature topotactic um, synthesis method, which involves calcium hydride. And it turns out that hydro hydride um, 
H minus ions incorporate in the structure, not by 100%, but later analysis showed it was about 70%. So where these hydride ions go is that they bridge the, the chains. So this is no longer a one-dimensional material. It's actually a, closer to a two-dimensional material. And in fact, this was the first system that showed that hydride ions are actually really effective at transmitting super exchange interactions. We all know about oxygen anions, but it turns out that the H minus does this very well. And that makes this thing that you might think was a one dimensional material, it makes it actually, um, uh, it, it makes it um, uh, higher dimensional, pushes the nail temperature up, it probably means this cobalt is no longer in the one oxygen oxidation state, it's now gone up to the two oxidation state, which of course is more stable for it. Okay, um, Keeping with the theme of molecular magnets, um, you can use uh, various building blocks when you make molecular magnets. So it's well known ammonia has a lone pair on, uh, but so do these organic molecules. So pyridine, pyrazine, uh, they have lone pairs on. And the lone pair you can think of as a bit of glue. It will stick things together. So um, pyrazine, this molecule here that has a lone pair on either end, um, can can be used to stick together copper ions. So you have copper, copper, and then you have pyrazine in between. And that makes a very good one dimensional chain material. And using mu SR, we were able to show that this, um, this orders at 100 millikelvin. Um, and the J in the, along the chains is 10 Kelvin. So the, this is really a very anisotropic system because the ratio of the nail temperature to J is of the order of 10 to the minus two. So this is a very um, anisotropic material. Now, it turns out that there's lots of these low dimensional organic materials. And one of the questions is, when do they order? Uh, when do they show three dimensional order? And the problem is that this is quite hard to do by thermodynamics. And this is uh, it's an interesting reason why this occurs. So this is another one of these organic, low dimensional organic materials. In fact, here's two examples with rather complicated formulae, but again, you have copper pyrazine uh, chains and, and um, uh, 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 chain arrangements. Now, if you measure the heat capacity, you basically get a big peak in the, in the heat capacity, in the magnetic heat capacity, which is centered roughly on J. And this is because uh, when you cool it down, the spins start to order and they correlate. And therefore, entropy is emitted from the sample, giving you a peak in the heat capacity. And this is centered on um, roughly on J. But at much lower temperature down here, the system suddenly realizes that it isn't one dimensional, it's actually three dimensional. Those smaller couplings become important. And so the system suddenly shows long range magnetic order. And that means that you get a peak at the heat capacity. But essentially the problem is almost all of your entropy has gone. So there's nothing left for the sample to give. So in fact, there is a tiny kink as shown by those red lines, but I mean, really you can't see it. Uh, it's it's almost invisible on this on these diagrams, uh, the peak there. Um, you know, there is a very small kink there and a very small kink there, but it's really almost impossible to see. On the other hand, if you do a mu SR experiment, it's completely obvious because when the spins order, they suddenly slow down and the muons then suddenly start seeing a frequency. In this particular case, it's three frequencies. In this case, it was two frequencies. You can plot the temperature dependence and it's completely obvious that this is the nail temperature. So uh, this is a case where mu SR really wins over, over thermodynamic measurements. You can do the same in, in heat in susceptibility. So this is another material, another low dimensional material. Uh, there is a small kink in the susceptibility, which is the onset of 3D order. But of course, the susceptibility is dominated by this big thermodynamic feature, which is telling you the J along the chains but mu SR really clearly shows you, yes, there is a, there's a phase transition to long range order just above three and a half Kelvin. It's complete, completely obvious. Um, now, I just want to move quickly to superconductors as a, as a, as a final example before I get to the, uh, to the decoherence part, which I will spend just the last 10 minutes on. But just to say something quickly on superconductors. So first of all, many superconductors are magnetic. So the, this is some... Uh, 
Uh, these are some plots for, for sodium iron arsenide doped with cobalt. Uh, this is magnetic when you have no doping, but as you um, as you dope, you get rid of this magnetic phase. And you can see here there, there are two frequencies. There's a fast frequency and a slow frequency. And as you as you dope, you uh, you get rid of those frequencies. So you can use this to follow the magnetism. Um, so this is showing you the precession frequency as a function of of, of uh, doping. And, and temperature. Uh, you can also use synchrotron X-rays to measure the structural distortion, and you see the phase transitions are not at the same uh, temperature. Uh, this allows you to build the phase diagram, which I haven't got here, but um, you can use these things to get the phase diagram. But muons are also useful where you have superconductors, and just to briefly explain why that is, if you apply a magnetic field to a normal metal, so you apply a magnetic field, the magnetic field is the same all the way through the sample, and then your muons will just process with some frequency. But if the sample is superconducting, you will have a vortex lattice, which means that field will penetrate at particular positions, and that means that the, um, the internal field will oscillate inside the sample. That means that some muons will land on the vortex core, and they will process quite fast, some will lie, uh, will, will land away from the vortex cores and process more slowly. And that means that you will see an oscillation that dies away. Um, if the penetration depth is shorter, that means you will see an oscillation that decays more quickly. So you can use the decay rate of these oscillations to estimate the penetration depth. And um, on, on uh, Another way of looking at this is if you think of the vortex lattice and you think of the field contours in, inside the vortex lattice, this will um, be related to a probability distribution of what magnetic field will you find if you choose a point randomly in this direction. So this will have a maximum point at the vortex core. It will have a minimum point away from the vortex core. And then there'll be quite a high probability of stopping somewhere in this saddle point in the distribution. Now, when you do a, a MUSR experiment, of course, you, you fire muons everywhere. So you completely sample this distribution, and therefore you can pull out this probability distribution. So um, this then gives information about the penetration depth. You can use it to study vortex lattice melting and so forth. And I won't go into the details of that, but that's something that can be done with a large number of superconductors. So. Um, yeah. Uh, so, for example, the sort of thing that you can do is you can measure the superfluid stiffness related to the penetration depth as a function of the transition temperature. And this is something uh, in a plot pioneered by Tomo Umura in uh, Columbia um, University. Uh, you can you can look at um, trends among superconductors. So this is just showing you some of the trends in some of the iron base superconductors. Um, and uh, again, this, these are just some measurements of the penetration depth as a function of temperature um, on some lutetium zirconium um, boride superconductors in collaboration with the Slutchenko group in, um, in, uh, in Moscow. OK, so finally, I would just like to tell you a little bit about some very recent work that we've done where we've been really trying to understand the quantum nature of the muon's interaction with its environment. And just to uh, go back to some very old result uh, from the 1940s, when people first started studying um, nuclear magnetic resonance, one of the things they noticed was that a nuclear magnetic resonance line is not a delta function. You know, you're applying a magnetic field, you're splitting these Zeeman levels, you're putting in a photon which matches those levels. So why is the nuclear magnetic resonance line not a delta function? And Van Vleck uh, um, realized why this was and realized that it was to do with the dipolar interaction between a nucleus and its environment. So the nucleus is not only sitting in a magnetic field, it's sitting in the magnetic field from all its neighbors. And sometimes these add and sometimes they subtract. And it means your, nu your nuclear magnetic resonance line actually follows a Gaussian. And you can think of this as being a consequence of the central limit theorem that you take some complicated interactions and you know all probability distributions end up being Gaussian when you do repeated convolutions. And um, Van Vleck uh, did some quantum mechanics where he related the second moment of this distribution uh, to 
the commutator of the dipolar Hamiltonian and a Pauli spin um, matrix. And um, he worked out that this second moment would follow this particular formula, which is very well known in NMR. Okay, so what this, of course, means is that, uh, oh, the other thing I should say is that um, in the 1960s, uh, Kubo and Toyabi um, did what many theoretical physicists do, which is that they thought of a hypothetical experiment that cannot be achieved, and they um, they thought about a zero field NMR experiment. This isn't something you can do. And they worked out what the zero field analog of this curve is, and they predicted this kubo tayabi relaxation um, function. And in fact, it was exper observed experimentally using muons. Uh, kubo was still around to do this um, about 12 years later in the, in the late 1970s. Now, what this means is if you take something like sodium fluoride, and sodium fluoride is in toothpaste, so this is something you probably put in your mouth this morning. Um, so sodium fluoride has the sodium fluoride structure. It has um, sodium, uh, sodium and fluorine sitting on this cubic lattice. Uh, we know that when you put a muon in, it actually sits in this position. Uh, so uh, we know this from our calculations using density functional theory. So something I won't have time to talk about, but we do know where in the crystal lattice the muon goes because this is something we've developed methods of calculating that. Um, so the muon is sitting here, it's surrounded by nuclear moments. So therefore, if you do a muon measurement, you should see one of these kubo tabi relaxation functions. And the experiment was done in the 1980s by Jess Brewer and his colleagues. And what they found was you don't see anything at all like this. You see something very strange. In sodium fluoride, you see something with multiple oscillations. And in fact, you see the same in lithium fluoride and calcium fluoride and barium fluoride. You even see it, as um, myself and Francis Pratt discovered, you even see it in Teflon um, frying pans. OK, so um, so what's going on? Well, um, Jess Brewer realized uh, quite quickly that what's happening is that the muon is coupled strongly to these two fluorine um, nuclei that have a very large nuclear magnetic moment. And so therefore, what you must be seeing is a strange quantum oscillation, which is to do with the dipolar coupling between the muon and the fluorine nuclei. And you can do a calculation and show that the oscillation should take this form. And in fact, when you fit this form to these oscillations, the fits are very good, but you do have to put in some arbitrary relaxation function to get it to work, which um, people have used for uh, nearly 40 years. And I've been very unhappy about because there was no physics in that. And uh, what I want to tell you is we've now finished. Um, figured out the physics of that, and I think it's very interesting. So just to mention that we can see this in molecular magnets. This is something we did um, uh, yeah, 15 years ago. Now, let me just go back to where, where these oscillations are coming from. We have a dipole interaction between the fluorine nucleus and the muon nucleus. And when you do the quantum mechanics of the dipolar interaction, you find that there are four energy levels You'd expect that because the muon is a spin a half particle and the fluorine is a spin a half particle. So therefore, your Hilbert space is, is four dimensional. So you should expect four energy levels. And that's, in fact, what you get. Uh, you have the up, up and the down, down level. That's the muon spin and the fluorine spin in this representation. They both give you the same energy. But the uh, these, these other states with these entangled states uh, have these other energies. And what you're seeing when you see these oscillations is essentially um, you're, you're essentially seeing a superposition of these levels, which then interferes with these coherences. Now, if you put another fluorine in, you end up with an eight dimensional Hilbert space because you've added another spin a half particle and it goes as two to the power. The number of particles two to the power three is eight. And you get actually four energy levels because these are doublets. So there's four doublets. And you now get a slightly more complicated oscillation signal, uh, but this is essentially what we're we're measuring. Here in these graphs, I've been showing you the polarization of the muon spin and the polarization of the fluorine spins, but we can't measure that. We can only measure this one. Now, we realize that actually a better sample to look at than sodium fluoride is actually calcium fluoride. And the reason is that 99.9% .9 of the calciums have nu no nuclear spin, so we can just concentrate on the fluorines. 
And what we thought about doing was saying, OK, let's take the muon coupled to these two fluorines. But also there are a lot of other fluorines. What happens if we take the eight next nearest neighbours? Now, when you do that, you have a bigger Hamiltonian. Your Hamiltonian is now 2048 by 2048, but that is diagonalizable. That's relatively straightforward to do. And you can basically go through a procedure where you can work out the muon polarization uh, according to this um, bit of quantum mechanics. Uh, the problem, as I said, is the muon, the uh, Hilbert space is big. As you introduce more spins, uh, it grows exponentially with the with the um, number of spins included in the simulation. But just for the moment, I'm just going to take um, the muon and these um, 10 fluorine spins, which gives us uh, 11 spin a half particles. Now, you can begin to see how this is going to work, because if we just take the muon and two fluorines, uh, then we have these particular coherences. And I thought about plotting them on a graph where you plot one frequency against the other frequency. So each of these dots is telling you about a transition between one energy level and another and saying whether that coherence becomes important in the quantum superposition. So the bigger dot means it's a more important uh, contribution. Um, so this is a little bit reminiscent of what in 2D NMR is called a cozy plot. Um, now, if you add in the next nearest neighbor interactions, you've now got 2048 energy levels. So those four energy levels there broaden into these bands. And the equivalent plot looks like this. So you can see you've gone from these nice sharp dots to these things being smeared out. And therefore, when you plot the, um, uh, the polarization as a function of, uh, of, of time, you can now see where this relaxation is coming from. The relaxation is coming from the fact that we've broadened out those energy levels by including the more distant interactions. So another way of thinking about this is to think about this in terms of quantum information. And this is how the quantum information comes in. You say that your incoming muon is implanted with one qubit of quantum information. And if you just have the muon and two fluorines, that quantum information just rattles around a small system. And therefore, the entropy of the muon just oscillates backwards and forwards between zero when the muon is fully polarized to, um, to uh, losing its bit of information when it's all been transferred to the fluorine. But then it comes back again and the quantum information just oscillates backwards and forwards. But once you put in the next nearest neighbor spins, you see that the entropy of the muon degrades. And this is essentially because that quantum information is now rattling around all of the other um, fluorine spins in the system. And we can quantify this in terms of the uh, muon entropy rising and the way in which decoherence essentially is happening. Now, um, I'll just go through briefly uh, what we can do next, uh, which is, um, so we take, uh, to see whether this really works, we take our calcium fluoride. As I've said, we put the, we've got the muon here. This is the site that we found. Uh, we also know, in fact, that what happens is uh, the muon distorts its local environment. So by DFT calculations, you can see that the presence of the muon actually moves those two fluorines in slightly. You can see it also slightly repels those two calciums, which move very slightly, but the other ions do not move. Um, so this is something that we have we've calculated. Uh, if we do the same in in um, in uh, sodium fluoride, we have the same thing actually. So you get one of these distortions. The the two fluorines come in and the sodium is pushed out. And in the uh, calculation, I'll show you we've also included some further fluorines uh, in, in our in our simulation. Um, now this shows you data on calcium fluoride and sodium fluoride. Um, the dotted line that doesn't fit very well is where you only have the nearest neighbor and you don't put any fudge factor in, which is what people did in the past. Uh, the blue and the red curves are including uh, these further interactions. And I should also mention that we've got a, a, another scheme where we've worked out a correction factor for all of the other spins that we've missed out, because even in this graph, you can see that there are a whole lot of other fluorines in the in the in the um, in the. Uh, um, in the crystal that we haven't included, but we have a numerical way of estimating their contribution, which we're also including in the calculation. And I, I won't go into the details of that, but it's in, it's in our paper. So the nice thing about these fits 
is actually there, there are only two fitting parameters that go into them, essentially two meaningful fitting parameters. One of them is the amount that the, the muon to the nearest neighbor fluorine dist distance changes. This is we've calculated with DFT. Uh, we also fit it, and you can see the fitted and the and the um, uh, DFT values. They're they're within 0 0.04 of an angstrom, and they're both very different from what you would have in the unrelaxed structure, which is 1.362 angstroms. And then the other thing is this um, this factor that we're using to account for the all of the other spins that we've not um, included. We can work out what this should be from theory, which is 0 0.937. And in our experimental fit, we get 0 0.920. So this is very similar. So I think we have a very good indication that we are able now to uh, model our decohering environment. And we use um, uh, this, this little technique for, um, uh, for modeling the effect of the other fluorines that we are not included in our simulation. It works very well for sodium fluoride as well. Sodium fluoride is a bit more complicated because we have to include the quadrupole interaction on the sodium ions. We can't ignore the sodium ions in the way that we can ignore the calcium ions and calcium fluoride. So again, just to stress, calcium fluoride, sodium fluoride, they are not magnetic. They do not ship, they're not interesting materials for magnetism. You know, they're rather boring for electronic magnetism, but all of the nuclear interactions we can model now. Um, and we feel we have a very good understanding of this. So what we're now moving into is using some of these techniques to, to model the effect of muons in frustrated systems with electronic magnetism. And that's the next thing that we're going on to. So I hope in this talk, um, I think, I hope that's about the right time. Um, I've been able to give you uh, some discussion on what the MUSR technique is, how it works, and some examples of the ways in which it can be used. And thank you very much for your attention.